I'm so glad to be here today. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, um, Rachel, which was so um, poetic and generous. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Skip Rutherford, for having me here, and Nikolai for also um, organizing. It's really special to be back here. So I just want to say first how much it means to me to be back in Arkansas. This is a place where I feel like I came of age that transformed how I think, transformed my politics, um, transformed my own sense of who I want to be in the world, what kind of humility and love I want to enter it with. And it means so much to me to be here um, in Little Rock. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit of the story of the book. And thank you to those of you who have read it, and apologies for having to hear the story again. Um, and after I tell you a little bit about the story, I want to talk about some policy proposals and ways we talk about justice and education in America, ways to change how we talk about it. And finally, I want to talk about telling stories, because that's what this book is. I mean, it feels strange for it to be an object uh, I, I, you know, an object, it's very uncomfortable. It's really just me trying to tell a story and me trying to tell it over a very long time and hating a lot of the ways I told it and starting over and starting over again. And this is what we do every day with each other, with people who are different, with people who we love, people we've known all our lives, how to talk about ourselves. And so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about storytelling and what I've learned about storytelling. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the story. Um, I came to Helena, Arkansas when I was 22 years old. I was very idealistic. I was quite sheltered. I came from two Taiwanese immigrant parents. If you have Taiwanese immigrant parents, you know they are no joke. Uh, <laughs> they didn't get the memo about self-esteem. Um, they had no idea what I was doing in Arkansas. They were very sad that I wasn't in medical school and that I wasn't making a lot of money. Um, God bless my parents. And I was determined to make a difference. I knew it sounded cheesy. I knew that there were some people who were cynical and said, oh, you just want to feel good about yourself. I didn't care. I just wanted to make a difference. And I was assigned, as Rachel mentioned, to an alternative school which was basically a dumping ground for kids who were bad, kids who had been kicked out of other schools, kids who had been expelled, kids who got into fights, kids who didn't show up. Um, it was all African American, and half of the staff at the school were substitute, substitute teachers. The school had no teams, no guidance counselors, no mental health counselors, no coach, no librarian, no functioning library, in fact. But we did have a police officer. And when the student police officer walked in the classroom, the students sat up because they knew to respect the police. My first year of teaching, I was struggling. I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to reach students. And the one thing that I discovered, and if there's one thing somebody takes away from the book, it is this, it is that the students who seem to be the worst kids, who have been labeled as incorrigible, are thirsty for quiet spaces. And that's something remarkable to think about, that during silent reading, when I found the right books for students, you couldn't hear a pin drop for 20 minutes. These are noisy kids. Remember the kids who get kicked out for kicking over a trash can over at the other middle school? And they are dead quiet because Quiet is so difficult to achieve in their lives. They're thirsty for books. They're telling me they sit up all night reading books. They want more books to carry around. They're proud to carry these books. And that struck me. It is so different from our portrait of these bad kids. Um, and among these kids that I met, my second year of teaching was Patrick. He was a student who was quiet, who was introspective who wanted to read. He didn't have to convince to write poetry because he understood it was like writing lap li rap lyrics. They're the same. And he had just one problem, and that was that he wouldn't show up to school. He would just disappear for days on end. And I was crazy, right? I was 22, I was like, oh, this problem is easy. I just go to his house and tell him to come to school. 
And in some ways, it was that easy, because when I went to his house, he looked shocked to see me, and he's not very good at lying, and he said, well, I just I didn't come. I didn't see why I should come. And he started to come to school every day. He started to come. He started to improve. He won the most improved award at the school. And it seemed like things were getting better. I thought, oh, I'm making a difference now. At the end of these two years, I'm trying to decide whether to leave or to stay. It is an agonizing decision for me. My parents, bless their hearts again, um, come to visit me in Helena. I show them my classroom. I've covered my classroom with pictures of my students, pictures of their poems. Um, I've realized that it doesn't help to have pictures of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. You need to put pictures of themselves. You cannot fill students up with ideas of who you think their hero should be. You need to fill them up with warmth towards themselves. And that is why every day they saw pictures of themselves of their own work. So my parents come, they see the classroom. They come to a boys and girls club event that my friends have set up to create a boys and girls club. And I think it's happening, change is happening. My parents are transformed. And then what ensues is an incredibly public fight, which I soften the details of in the book, um, where my parents say all kinds of things. And it's so funny, when I talk to uh, non-Asian readers, they always say, your parents sound crazy. And when I talk to Asian readers, they're like, oh yeah, your parents sound really normal. Um, but my parents say stuff that, uh, that you can imagine. I've gotten into law school at this point, thinking of postponing a couple years at least. And I've promised Patrick and other students that I'm going to stay until they at least graduate from high school. So I've made these promises that I probably shouldn't have made. My parents say, what has become of, of our daughter? All you do is talk about school. All you do is talk about kids. They're not even your own kids. Other, other Taiwanese kids, why are they, they're so easy. They listen to their parents. They make money. They do science. Why do you have to be so difficult? And my mom, who is a very funny person, it's not funny when you're the target of her humor, um, who said, you know, you're going to stay single if you stay here. We know that everybody, she says, all your friends who have stayed are couples. She says, that's not an accident. She says, you're going to be lonely. I can tell you're lonely. And nobody wants to marry Mother Teresa. That's what she said. <laughs> I am a very filial child in Chinese culture, Taiwanese culture, you obey your parents. Love and obedience are one and the same thing. And I listen to my parents. I also do some soul searching. I am lonely. Maybe it's not so selfish to search for love. I go to law school. I don't find love. Um, <laughs> and fast forward three years, I get a phone call from one of my dear friends who has stayed in the Delta, who's still involved in Helena nonprofit work, and he says to me, Michelle, you had Patrick as a student, didn't you? My first thought is that Patrick has died, because I've had students pass away before. But my friend says to me, um, Patrick has gotten into a fight and killed someone. And I am devastated. I don't believe it, because I've had violent students, but he was not violent in my class. He was. He never bullied. When two students got into a fight, he broke up their fight. So I was struggling to understand how it happens that somebody nonviolent ended up in prison. I thought it had to be a mistake. I fly back three days after he's arrested, and I visit him in jail. And he tells me that it's true. He did get into, get into a fight and kill someone. At the end of law school, I'm again at a crossroads, and I'm thinking to myself, what if I had stayed? It sounds arrogant to say that somebody's life would be different if I had stayed, but if you know a rural area, you know that there's not many people. You know that relationships are what people are thirsting for. And you know also that dropouts are more likely to commit crime. That just that makes perfect sense. They don't have school, they don't have structure, they're bored, they get involved, they need a living. Um, so I'm wondering what if I had stayed? Maybe during this 
ethical dilemma I had three years ago, I became one of the people who um, made the wrong choice. And if you also know the Delta, as I'm sure a lot of you here are, know it more intimately than I do, you know that it's a place that people of means leave. This is true today in terms of the best high school graduates leave and don't come back. And it's been true for 100 years that all the studies show that in the Great, Migra in the Great Migration, those who left the Delta tended to have more resources, more connections, more education, so that those left behind are with the least amount of contact with the outside world. So I was trying to situate myself in this world, and I thought I am one of those who leave others behind and doesn't stay. I decided to go back. I had this job in California in legal aid, and I, throughout this time I'm thinking, well, I'm still, I still have my liberal cred, I'm doing legal aid, I'm making no money, but there's a part of me that's like, I did not do what I was supposed to do in Arkansas. So I go back, and this is where the heart of the book really takes place, which is when I start to read with Patrick every day in jail, in the Helena County Jail. I just want to share three different things we read in jail to give you a sense of the kinds of conversations that we were having. Um, the first thing that I had Patrick do was write a letter to his daughter. I didn't think much of what this meant. He had a daughter who was at that time a year old, a baby daughter. I just thought it's good for him to write to her. It's good for him to have her on his mind. And he wrote a letter that was startling in terms of what it said. It said, I'm so sorry for not being there for you. Um, I'm so sorry for the mistakes I've made. I'm sorry I've let you down. And I thought to myself, this isn't the kind of letter that I thought I wanted him to write, full of apology for who he is. And I thought, we need to change how he thinks about himself, and we're going to do that with reading. As I tell you some of these reading scenes, I want you to think about two questions that have troubled me that I still don't have answers to. The two questions are this. First is, can a book change a life? Can a book change a life? I see some nodding. Yes, no, yes, okay, we'll think about that. The second question is, how is reading together different from reading alone. Reading together, how is that different from reading alone? Let's maybe raise our hands if we've been read to as children. That's so lovely. Long live reading together in the book. Um, and how many of us have read to others as uh, parents or friends? Yes. This is a different experience from reading alone. We know this. We know that it's intimate that you grow a common language together, you, have the same, you become scared of the same monster, you become loving towards the same friendly bear, um, whatever book you're reading. And I thought a lot about this over these seven months. The first thing we read together was the book, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is a story of four children. When I was growing up, I really related to Lucy because readers tend to be narcissistic. And I was like, I am the hero, the, the little girl who opens the closet and isn't afraid to go in and lead the children into this world. When Patrick read it and I asked him who we related to, his answer startled me and helped me reflect on my own narcissism. He said, my, he said Edmund. And Edmund, as you recall in the story, is the one who... Um, leaves the siblings and gets tricked by the witch to eat these delicious Turkish delights and spends the rest of the story trying to repent. I said, why do you relate to Edmund? And he said, because Edmund abandoned his siblings and got tricked by the witch. Throughout the story, he was looking to see what would happen to Edmund. Would Edmund get forgiven by his siblings? Patrick was also from a family of four children. And reading together helped me think from his perspective, from his desire for warmth towards himself, his desire for a happy ending that he didn't think he deserved, and his connection to his family, his sense that he had failed them. 
That's the first example. The second is poetry. One of the most lovely things about us reading together or being together is that I get to share poems, which some say is dying. I refuse to believe the poem is dying. Um, and poetry is so inviting to a student who feels like he's not good at English because there is so much silence on the page, because it is much more like a song and less like text and grammar and punctuation. And there are a few poems that really spoke to Patrick. The first is haikus, these lovely nugget-sized Japanese pieces of short lines that express some image. I just wanna share a few of the haikus that, um, that struck Patrick and I also really love. The first um, goes like this, uh, napped half the day, no one punished me. Another goes like this, it's imagine snow, winter's coming, you can't, you never see your neighbor. My neighbor in deep autumn, how does he live, I wonder. Yet another, you can imagine seeing two animals when it first starts snowing. Deer licking first frost off each other's coats. So lovely, right? Just that kind of warmth of all creatures. Um, yet another, which Patrick thought was laughed out loud. Um, Don't worry, spiders. I keep house casually. <laughs> It's so amazing to discover poetry alongside somebody, to, to adopt new favorites because that's his favorite, to think about a poem differently because he thought about it differently. Um, and Patrick wrote like a hundred haikus during this time, haikus that expressed how he thought. One of them, um, I think went like this, uh, outside under scorching heat, a man is working humming calmly to himself, because that's what he wanted to be outside, working calmly. Um, that's a second scene. A third has to do with reading Frederick Douglass. And once again, when we're thinking about reading alone versus reading together, when I read P Frederick Douglass, I came away with it thinking, this is an incredible man, this is an orator, this is a representative of American history. This is an abolition, abolitionist. This is a man who was invited to Lincoln's White House, the first black man. This is a good American icon. This is a man I want to know. Those are not wrong thoughts, but they're very different from what Patrick came away with. There is one scene that made Patrick physically stop when he was reading. It is a scene in the holidays where the masters gave sla slaves gin, gives them a lot of gin. Why? Because they knew the slaves would get drunk on the gin. They knew the slaves would stagger and stumble on the fields. And that the slaves would conclude, we don't deserve freedom. We can't handle freedom. When we're given freedom, we ruin our freedom. And that it was a tactic of the masters to keep the slaves feeling undeserving to be free. When I, I don't even remember reading that alone. I don't remember. But when Patrick read it, it broke him apart. There's a line from Kafka that says a book should be like a frozen ax that breaks the sea inside you. And I asked Patrick why the scene moved him so much. And he said he saw himself in that. He said he saw his fellow inmates in that scene this feeling that they don't deserve to be free because they keep messing up. We tend to think of slavery as something that's over and done, and yet these emotions, these feelings of whether we deserve to be liberated continue today. So all three of those scenes have to do with reading together. But what really moved me at the very last month we were reading together is when he started writing these extraordinary letters to his daughter, when he transformed and converted the energy of that reading into writing. 
He read a book called Gilead by Marilyn Robinson, one of my favorites, which is about a pastor in a rural town writing to his son. And she begins these beautiful lines that Patrick loved. And they begin like this. If you ever wonder what, have you, what you've done in your life, and everybody does wonder sooner or later, you have been God's gift to me, a miracle, more than a miracle. And Patrick wanted to write a letter like that to his daughter. He read another letter from James Baldwin to his nephew, um, from 1962, which I'll read um, here also, if I can find it. I tell you this because I love you, and please don't you ever forget it. You must survive because we love you, and for the sake of your children and your children's children. And then Baldwin goes on, for this is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. You come from sturdy peasant stock, men who picked cotton and dammed rivers and built railroads, and in the teeth of the most terrifying odds, achieved an unassailable and monumental dignity. During this time, Patrick started writing letters to her that were so different from the letters when we started. These letters, imagine them canoeing down the Mississippi River They imagine them plucking berries from the trees, uh, dewberries. They imagine them reading together the line which in the wardrobe. And there were letters where he shared knowledge of what he knew, of what he learned, and felt a kind of warmth towards himself that he lacked at the beginning. This is where the book would end if I wanted to end it with a happy ending. But the book doesn't end here. And this is where we have to talk about the first question, can a book change a life? Books have certainly changed my life, but I don't believe that they completely transformed Patrick's life. They changed how he felt towards himself at one time. They changed his experience of incarceration. They changed his idea of what he wanted to learn about the world. But they didn't change his life when he got out. The obstacles and I naively thought that they would, that they would offer this kind of inner resource and reservoir for him to go against the world. But the obstacles that he faced when he got out of prison were so crushing, they're still crushing, Um, and I hope we can think today about ways to help him and other people in his circumstance. So let me transition now to the second part of what I wanna talk about, which is policy and discourse. These are words that Sometimes we shudder, I I even shudder at, I'm like, no, no more policy and discourse because they're vague words. But with discourse, I just want to say it's a way of saying, how do we make what's invisible visible? How do we bring issues that are invisible and make them visible? There are three things that I think are invisible in our national discourse. I think people in Arkansas get it much better than people on um, the coast, but I'll go ahead and talk about them anyways. The first issue that's invisible is violence. Violent offenders is how we talk about people like Patrick. Even liberals, it's finally changing, but the past 20 years, as James Foreman has written powerfully about, he's a Yale law professor who was a public defender, liberals have ceded the territory of violent offenses to conservatives. So that the violent offender has become this really scary predator and we, th- we know what that looks like because we watch TV. I admittedly watch a lot of TV. Um, the serial killer, Dexter, Hannibal, CSI, Sherlock Holmes, the scary sociopathic killer is actually a tiny, tiny percentage. Most violent offenses come from poverty. They come from situations of fights gone mad. And they come from a lack of prosecution by police. And we have to talk about it. The tendency is to talk about nonviolent offenses drug offenses, and that's good, it's good to reform, but 50% of state prisoners are violent offenders, and we have to talk about their stories, what they go through, and how to rehabilitate them. Let's go back to what happened to Patrick that night. A man came to his porch with his younger sister. His younger sister's in special ed, she's three years younger. Remember that Patrick is older, and the only man in the house, or the only sibling in the house, The man is 25, Patrick is 18. The man is drunk, the man is aggressive. 
The autopsy has him at a 0.26 alcohol level. And Patrick keeps telling him to get off his porch. Patrick gets a knife and stabs him three times. And it takes a long time for the ambulance to come. Did Patrick overreact? Probably, maybe. Was it self-defense? Possibly. Was it defense of uh, his house, of his property? Yes. These are difficult questions. The question to me isn't, should he be punished or not be punished? But it's to ask, in what circumstances did this violence arise? All the studies show that there are higher rates of homicide in communities when there is a low rate of prosecution of crimes. As Danielle Allen puts it in her book, um, when murder goes unpunished, murder begets murder. And that makes sense, right? If your friend gets killed and the police doesn't go after the person, you think you have free reign to retaliate, you think there is no justice, you think you have to enact justice yourselves. So self-defense occurs more in poor communities where police are failing. The second part of humanizing violent offenders is just to get at the inner life of a person. When I talk to Patrick about these legal defenses, I'm a lawyer, remember, self-defense, offensive property. He didn't want to hear about legal defenses. He didn't want to get off. He wanted to be punished. He didn't want to hear about sociological causes of his crime. He's a, he was very Christian and asked me if he was going to go to heaven. And this is part of the story I want to tell to get a sense of this person and how he needs healing but doesn't have any guidance on it. So that's the first element of how we change our discourse and make the invisible visible. We have to talk about violent offenders. The second is curriculum. It seems like the only thing that happens in education course today, ed education discourse today is talking about charter schools. Are you for them or are you against them? If you're against them, you're sleeping with the conservatives. If you're for them, um, Wait, you're for them, you're sleeping with the conservatives, you're against them, whatever. Anyways, I don't want to talk about charter schools. I want to talk about curriculum. I want to talk about what's happening in a classroom. I want to talk about how do you get kids excited about reading. All the studies show that if you get a kid to fall in love with reading outside of class, his, his performance will improve inside of class. All the studies show that if you get a kid excited about writing outside of class, he's seven times more likely to succeed in writing inside of class. These seem really obvious, but somehow we don't talk about what this means for us. It means we have to find ways to get kids excited about reading and writing outside of class. So that means on playgrounds, that means in um, community centers, that means in the homes of people. And it means to think about access to books as well, right? We've heard of food deserts where, you know, there, where we know that there is a fresh food scarcity in rural areas and places where you can't find um, fresh groceries for hundreds of miles. There are also book deserts. Um, that's a phrase for when there's a lack of books. It's so great to be in an audience with Arkansas because I don't have to explain to you the lack of books in the Delta. You won't be shocked to know that there are a few bookstores for you know hundreds of miles, that public libraries are under-resourced. And that is something we want to think about when we think about how to get kids excited about reading and writing outside. The last thing, well, the last thing related to writing is writing can be really fun. Writing captions to photographs you've taken, writing scripts to movies you're making, writing radio programs for something you're going to be on, writing um, the narration of a dance that you're creating. Writing can be exciting, and we have to figure out ways to do that outside of the school because the school isn't working. The second part. Sorry, so the, those were the two things that were invisible in discourse, the curriculum and violence. Um, and the last is truancy. Patrick wouldn't come to school. Why? Why wouldn't he come to school? The answer is both really easy and hard. Um, it's hard because I still don't exactly know what he was doing. There is something that's impenetrable about that life. 
and somebody, um, and I want more people from Helena who are like Patrick to tell that story of, of what that day consists of. I have speculation of why they don't come to school. If you come to a school where kids get into a fights with each other and then are sent to jail, if you come to a school where somebody who talks back gets paddled and he's 15 years old, if you come to a school where half of the teachers are substitutes and let you go on the computers, school is very depressing. School doesn't seem like a route to a place. So that's one speculation I have about truancy. The other speculation is just um, that a lack of uh, structural support for parents. So Patrick's mother worked full time as a cook at a retirement home. She, um, I remember her telling me that she had to work night shifts and she worried about what Patrick was doing when she was gone. So a lack of paid, paid childcare, a lack of structural support for parents. And Patrick's father himself was an ex-felon who was in and out of prison. The last thing related to truancy, which we all know because we're intimate with rural areas, is the lack of things for kids to do. Patrick ended up in the hospital when he was 11 or 12 because he was just outside playing with a can of gas and it burned him all across his body. Um, and I thought that was, I didn't know if that was typical or not, but when I talked to some students from Helena about the book yesterday who are uh, at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, they said, oh yeah, we were just, just doing stuff because we had nothing to do. And so we already know this, but creating more opportunities for kids in rural areas to be doing things. Um, so yes, three policy things I wanna talk about. First is felons. How do we get felons to reenter society? We're back to that question, can a book change a life? Um, I know the ending is not a happy ending in the book. Uh, I know that I'm kind of embarrassed that the marketing makes it seem like I, you know, I lifted Patrick out of, out of his situation. I think I did in incarceration, but I didn't when he got out. So how do we encourage employers to hire felons? Not just to avoid discriminating against them, but to actually hire felons, to give them a chance. The job is a single thing that will rescue people. It is what Patrick most dearly wants, to work outside. I mean, he has a part-time job working at a cemetery setting tombstones, and he loves that job. He loves being outside, he loves being useful. But there are a few employers who want to take a shot on him. The second major thing we have to think about with policy, and I hope that it doesn't sound too radical, at least just entertain this idea, is to think about prisons. Who is in prisons? If we were to abolish prisons, what would our society look like? Okay, yes, there's a small minority of actually sociopathic people who repeatedly um, hurt people, but the vast majority of prison are there for mental health reasons, they need treatment. For drug addiction, addiction, they need treatment. And for property theft crimes, they're stealing because they're poor. Six states in America that have the least amount of access to mental health care are also the states that have the most amount of incarceration. We already know that we're on that list. We can guess who else is on that list. There is something wrong with the country when you think that the most number of mental health prisoners are housed not in treatment facilities, not in hospitals, but in jails and prisons, in Rikers, in New York, in Cook County Jail. And we have to really think about this link between mental health and felons, because as we know, there has to be some way to heal people who enter the jail. And when they exit the jail, you don't want them to be unhealed, right? The phrase that hurt people, hurt people, um, we know that, uh, we know that's true. The last thing, um, which is really dear to my heart, is how to create connections between urban and rural areas, and how to build institutions in rural areas. If you build it, they will come. 
One of the most exciting places that I worked at was San Quentin Prison in California, where hundreds of volunteers from colleges and universities would come in to teach college education programs for prisoners. An extraordinary number of prisoners who graduate from college degrees don't come back to prison. They go on to leave fulfilling lives. And I want Arkansas to be at the forefront of this in the South, to build these kinds of programs in prisons and jails that all the college students and university students flock to, that professors want to teach at, that other jails and prisons across the South want to look up to. Okay. We're reaching the end. The last thing is about telling stories. And this is really hard. It took me a long time to write this book. It took me seven years to write. And you're probably wondering, what took you so long? I can tell you. I was so afraid of the critic who would say to me, how dare you talk about Arkansas? You're not from there. You're not white or black. Um, you didn't even stay. And that's all true. I want somebody from Arkansas, from Helena, to write this book. I want somebody who stayed to write this book. And so much of writing this book was just finding my voice to talk about myself. Um, and this is the first thing about storytelling, is that you have to know where you're from. You have to know where you're from. And it was only through writing this book that I realized something. And I was 30 when I started writing this, or 29, and I realized that I didn't actually know myself very well. Um, I have avoided learning about being Asian American since, since I was born. And I had to figure out why. Why was I so uncomfortable? Why did I know so little? I grew up in uh, one of the few Asian Americans in Kalamazoo, Michigan. The people were really welcoming overall. But um, my parents never told me stories about Taiwan. So I didn't know anything growing up. And I think the reason why I attached myself to black tradition, to black stories, was that it was a way for me to become American, to adopt a kind of racial consciousness while also fitting in. And it's only when I started writing this book that I started asking my parents, where, or like, where are you from? Um, what is Taiwan like? And they still couldn't tell me because they'd grown up under an authoritarian regime before it democratized, so they weren't told stories about their history. And then I had to search more. My husband, who is from Taiwan, told me a lot, and now my parents accuse him of brainwashing me um, with a more liberal view of Taiwan. So, you know, it, bringing home a nice Taiwanese boy doesn't always help. Oh no, is this recorded? Okay, nobody send this to my parents. Um, uh, so I had to do that, and I understand now that I would have been a better teacher if I had known myself better, because students love to joke around, and I learned to joke back, so my students would be like, oh, do you know Jackie Chan, Ms. Kuo? And I, and I used to be really offended, but then now I was, then I just said to them, oh, are you related to Kobe Bryant? And they were like, wait, that's racist. I was like, yes. So, um, <laughs> And there are these brief moments in the classroom where I see more possibility. Like when I wanted students to quiet down, I would write these Chinese characters on the board and everybody would just go quiet. They were like, they wanted to know more. There's such curiosity about other places and other cultures and I should have tapped into that. I should have shared more. But because I didn't know myself enough, I didn't know how to share that. So the first thing about telling stories is just really figuring out what you're comfortable is with what your silences are. The second thing about telling stories is that you have to have moments that I call the full of crap moments, which is I am full of crap. And I have many of those moments in the book where I realize I'm full of crap. Um, and we know this when we talk to people, we don't like it when people think they know everything, when they won't change their mind. Um, but equally true, you also have, moment, have to have moments where you're confident that other people are full of crap because that is what gives you the conviction to keep writing because you're writing against some dominant story, you know. Uh, and I guess, you know, the words are more often used with a full of, more often used are humility and vulnerability, but I like, I like saying I'm full of crap. I'm full of crap. We all practice saying that. Um, and the third thing that a story has to have is transformations. We like stories with transformations. You think about the Greek myths where a person changes into a tree or a nightingale 
or a rock or an animal, and there's something fantastic about that possibility. It's why kids and adults love fantasy, just this possibility of thinking totally differently about the world, this idea that you can have this permanent change. You're not attached to yourself, to your mistakes, to who you are, um, and we want transformations in a story. I think a lingering question in the book is whether the transformation in Patrick lasted. We know that it happened. We know that transformations happened to me, but we don't know exactly how they last when he gets out of prison. Um, and that's okay. The transformation doesn't need to be so cheery, but it needs to happen. And we want to desire each for our own lives um, because um, we want that, there to be that sense of magic and divinity um, and that, that this is possible. So those are ideas I have, and I thought it would be appropriate just to end with uh, two poems that Patrick especially loved, that I also love, um, to close this off, since how often do we get to read poetry together? If you want another one, just say, because I have a lot of poems that I want to read. <laughs> The first poem um, is called Love After Love. I think it's something we can all relate to. Uh, it's by Derek Walcott, who uh, is a tremendous poet. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome, and say, sit here, eat, you will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit. Feast on your own life. The second is a simple poem, um, also by Derek Walcott. And I just want to read the lines that Patrick really loved. Days I have held, days I have lost, days that outgrow like daughters, my harboring arms. Do we have room for one more poem? Well, just one more poem. OK, why not just read poetry all day? Let's see. Um, this is from Mary Oliver, and um, it closes the book because Patrick, I sent it to him after I'd left the Delta a second time, and he really loved this poem. Truly we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lamb. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity while we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so lovely. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We've got time for a couple of questions before we do the book signing, because I know you'll want to visit with her individually. So anybody have a quick question before we go to the book signing? Anybody about Helena, Arkansas have a quick question? <laughs> uh, because I have one, and I'm glad they don't, because here's the question I want to ask. Patrick is working part-time uh, at the cemetery. Tell us about his life, I mean, tell, tell us how he's doing, about his daughter, what's going on with with, with him right now? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. And it's 
uh, his daughter is doing great. That is the happy news. She's a fourth grader. She loves reading and math. She's in a good school, um, in touch with some of her teachers who say she's doing well. So that is great. Uh, Patrick is still struggling. I have a secret hope that people, especially employers near Helena and in Helena, will read the book and want to give him a chance to take the time to train him, to, un to understand that if you come out of prison, you're struggling with, uh, you're going to be struggling. It's, tra it's traumatic. But to be willing to train and help them. Oftentimes, it's going to be small-time business owners who take a chance because corporations have rules against hiring people with records or they give priority to people without records. We know that there aren't that many small-time business owners. We know that they tend to give jobs, understandably, to family and friends. So he is struggling. Um, he loves what he does occasionally. It's not full-time. There's no health care benefits. It's just minimum wage. Uh, helps sometimes setting stones at the cemetery. And he's shown me some of the stones he set there, beautiful and he's really proud of them. Um, but I'm hoping that he can do more. He has a certificate, he got a certificate in carpentry, he got his GED in state prison. And um, I've encouraged him to take more classes at the college. I think motivation is a problem. These are real mental health issues. Um, I don't know if that helps. No, that's good, yeah. because uh, yeah. I think it's important to know that you're still in touch with him and that we're trying to help and people that can help Patrick, there are a lot of connections in this room. Uh, people know people, and we can do some of what Michelle has done, the teacher, a student, and a life-changing friendship, reading with Patrick. Let's thank Michelle for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Please come visit with her and, and, and